All right, we're set up here um, to talk a little bit about how you lay a gun stock out on a, on a uh, blank. What I don't want to do is spend too much time discussing how this is done, just to give a quick overview, because really this, this episode or this project is about um, doing this, this, um, this 06 or 03 Springfield. So I really want to get back into that as, as quickly as we can. But I did want to give you a little bit of an overview of how we, um, how we lay these things out and how we think about the relationship of the, the gun stock on the, the blank itself. Uh, there's, some, there's some critical things that, that we need to think about. Uh, the first thing we need to make sure of is that in this area, the pistol grip area, up through this, this area in the receiver. So from about here to here, we need to make sure that the grain is fairly straight, that it runs back to front, that there's not a lot of, lot of angles to the grain, um, that there's not a lot of twist or, or figure in that area uh, it's, uh, that might interfere with the strength of the um, strength of the, the stock or the wood in those areas. Because frankly, most of that recoil comes back in a straight line from, from the recoil surface all the way back into the shooter's shoulder. Uh, and this, the grip area, is generally the weakest area in, in the stock. So we want to make sure that grain is fairly straight. When we look down on the blank itself, um, we need to see those areas where, where the grain is, is as straight as is reasonable. Uh, we want to make sure, for instance, that when we look at the grain from, from down in this direction, that we're not missing something, so we're getting that length in the in the correct uh, correct location, or that's that uh, pistol grip area rather in the correct correct location. Um, it's always nice to have a lot of pretty wood or pretty grain, uh, probably in the butt stock especially, but uh, all of that all of that pretty uh, isn't going to do any good if the gun comes apart in the shooter's hand. So we want to make sure we've we've got that that correct. So frankly, what we're going to do is we're going to simply take uh, take the gun stock or take a stock that is similar, or take an old gun stock, or even the barrel in action. We can we can assemble the barrel in action, you know, with with um, with the um, pistol with the box mag and trigger guard air section in, installed, and we can move it around that way as well, uh, just so we get a sense of where that where that grip is is going to be. Um, once we've sort of understood that, then we have the ability uh, to, to sort of move this thing around in the blank so that we've enhanced or, or got the, 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 the finest figure that we can showing up in, in that area of the, of the gun stock that really, that really sort of speaks to, speaks to the design, speaks to the figure, and, and enhances, enhances the, uh, the gun as well. We need some fairly straight, uh, some fairly straight grain up in this area as well. And if these stocks are cut out of either root stock or cut out of uh, the crotch wood, it's generally true that you get a small section of that figure, and then that the rest of the gun stock should be fairly, uh, should be fairly straight. Uh, once we've sort of understood where we want the uh, the gun stock to be located in the blank. Then we're just going to take a colored marker and sort of mark this this all out. Um, and we 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 can either mark it right to the section, or we can we can put like a half inch um, half inch relief all the way around, so that that we're taking that gun that that gun stock out of um, a larger section of the blank which will give us more room to work with um, as we're doing this. When we are doing this, we need to also think about where our datum point ends up, or datum point ends up for, for the gun stock for all the, the, the rest of the machining that we're going to do to the, um, to the stock. Um, I think everybody, every, every uh, stock maker probably has their own methods or their own way of laying out, their own ways of, 
of creating their, their datum. For me, I usually use the top flat as the datum, and um, there's a few reasons that I do that. Uh, one, one reason is, is it gives me a, a bigger, larger surface to really work off from. And when you think about how you inlet a, um, a receiver and barrel into a, into a gun, generally the rule of thumb is that the barrel itself is 50% of its OD. So ha roughly half the, the, uh, the barrel is, is inletted down into the, into, the, um, into the stock. And then the remaining 50% is, is above. And the reason we do that is because, because that's the tangent point. That's the widest part of, of the barrel. Uh, so there's less likely to see to see gaps and, and other other um, other um, things that sort of interfere with the look of the gun. Once we've got it all laid out, um, frankly, uh, there's just just a whole lot of extra wood uh, on these blanks if if you buy the blanks well, and we got to get rid of all that extra wood. Uh, sometimes sometimes there's extra width on these things that are well in excess of, of what we need uh, for, for our minimum di dimensions on a gun stock. Um, and when I slab, sometimes I'll slab that excess wood off and uh, I've been known to use that, that little piece of slab uh, as a top for a guitar. So, so, so we don't want to necessarily um, just cut this stuff away and then um, throw it away because it has, it's, it's gorgeous wood and it has value in other places. So we could use it for inlays. Uh, we could use it for the tops of a guitar. Um, there's just so many opportunities to use this stuff. And you pay enough money as it is for these blanks. So getting as much use out of them as you can is, is valuable to, to you as an artist. So we do that. Once we've got this all laid out and we've maybe removed any, any thickness that we have to, uh, we'll take it over to the bandsaw and we'll simply cut away that excess material uh, that, that exists, again, in, in excess of, of the final shape. Those pieces as well have other, other uses. So you may get these large, large clumps of, of material that you can get out in this pistol grip area. And you can, you can really get a sense of how big, big a piece you're left over with. And we can use those for things if it's large enough for pistol grips, uh, bridges on guitars. I mean, there's just, there's just so, many, so many opportunities to use these things. Uh, I guess the other, the other problem with that is you end up storing this stuff and after 40 years you can end up with probably more than you'll ever use. So at some point you make a decision to either throw it away or give it away. Um, once we've removed all that excess material, then we have to cut our datum. And as I mentioned, for me that datum is, is that top flat. Um, we, we, I do most of my, my measuring and most of my locating off that top flat. And I'll put that on the, uh, using the bridge port. Um, bridge port, it's just, it's just uh, ready made for, for that kind of, kind of use. Uh, my bridge port is all hand. It's, it's a 60s era bridge port. Um, I bought it surplus. I bought it right. Uh, and it's just all hand cranks, uh, boys and girls. Uh, no CNCs there. It's just just me sort of doing lots of measuring and lots of um, lots of calculating in in, in that regard. Um, and I'll I'll eventually even use the bridge port to cut in cut in some of those rough rough inlets, uh, and then then finalize those inlets with with chisels, files, and and other things. So that's how we get to to the layout. That's how we get to that that top. Um, that top datum or datum point. Uh, the next thing we got to do is we got to start, we need to start removing material. Uh, it's taking what is, what is a, a very square plank, a very square piece of wood, and we start, have to start shaping it so that it begins to look like, like a gun stock, um, whether, it's, whether it's the Springfield or, or this, this Ruger. Uh, we have to do that. Um, there's all kinds of ways to do that. Again, we could put it on the bridge port and really mill away uh, where we can some of the, some of the largest um, excesses of wood. We can do it that way. Um, I, I usually use probably a combination of all the things we're going to talk about. But in, 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 in most cases, uh, I'm much more comfortable starting out with, with, a, um, with, a, um, with a hand plane. 
Um, and uh, the hand plane is just a way to start removing a lot of materials quickly. Um, I've got that laid down flat on the sole and somebody's going to watch this and say, oh, you should never use a hand plane flat on the sole and they're right. Normally I leave them like this. Uh, the blade is retracted and I left it this way uh, as a visual for the cameras. Same on my little, my little um, hand plane. This is, for, uh, this is much smaller for, for finer details and I've got them even smaller than this depending on where I am inside that blank. Um, this bugger is a rasp. This bugger will remove lots of material um, in, in, in huge chunks when we start trying to get into those final shapes. From there we get into rasp. Uh, I, am a, I am a guy who just, just is most comfortable using these, these hand rasp. Um, they just, they just, I'm connected. Um, it's, it's, my, it's, it's my mind connected to my hands uh, connected to the tools and, and, and that's how I work. I'm just, I'm just, like I said, I'm just in tune with these and, and this is what I, what I prefer to use. Probably a little bit slower uh, than using, a lot of, lot of guys will use spoke shaves. Uh, spoke shaves are great, um, but, but if they get caught in the grain uh, and they start following a grain line, uh, you're screwed. I mean, you, you very quickly can ruin a piece of piece of wood. And if they're well sharpened, um, you're probably going to avoid a lot of that. I'm, I'm just not comfortable with spoke shaves, so I generally stay away from them. Start out with these really aggressive uh, hand rasp. Uh, it's both flat on one side and then it's round or curved on, on, the, on the back side. Uh, these things, these, these, um, these aggressive ones, uh, they're, they're just huge. They hurt. Um, they take a lot of material off. And then as we begin to get closer and closer to our final dimensions, then we work into, uh, again, increasingly finer rasp. Uh, and then this is, this is my finish rasp. Um, it's, it's the, the teeth are finer. It still removes a lot of material, uh, but it doesn't leave these huge gouges behind where the, where the, where the teeth have passed. And then again, we get finer and finer. Uh, this is bastard files um, to get down into into sort of those final finishes. At some point, you've got to start sanding. Uh, you've got to start doing um, those final tweaks of those shapes. I use simple tools. Uh, this is a piece of uh, conduit for, for piping, for electrical piping. It is, it is just, it's light and it's just a great, a great, um, it's really, a, it's a good tool for for doing sort of round surfaces like inside inside the fluting uh, or in around the uh, pistol grip. Uh, I've got a, also a small rasp that, that I'll use to get in around the, uh, the uh, grip area. I also use a simple stick. This is a thin piece of mahogany that, that I cut oh so many years ago wrap a piece of sandpaper around that and it's, there's, there's, there's a flex, flexibility to this thing that, <laughs> that you might think, well, that's, you know, that's not what you want to use. For all you car guys, you know that when you sand surfaces on your cars, you want a fairly stiff, uh, stiff platen that you're using. Um, this flexible stick really allows me to sort of bend around some of these shapes when I'm, when I'm getting close. Um, I also use scrapers. I, uh, my, my favorite scraper is, is this one. This, this scraper, uh, I want to just really briefly talk about this. This was designed by a friend and mentor of mine, uh, Alan Carruth. Al is a, is a luthier. He, 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 does, he does just unbelievable work. Uh, he, makes, uh, he makes mostly acoustic guitars, violins, violas. Um, again, mostly all, all acoustic stuff. He's done, he has made a couple of electric guitars, but mostly he leaves that to me. Uh, he's, not a, he's not big into, a, into the electric scene. Uh, he will make them, but as an acoustic guy, um, just, just, just one of the best. Um, so Alan's here from Newport as well. So Alan's a local guy, but a local guy, but nationally known. So uh, Alan, Alan developed this, and, and I, it's become one of my go-to scrapers. It just works, works so well. So look Alan up, Alan Carruth. Um, 
All right, so, um, and again, of course, we have to do lots of measuring. Uh, so we're going to use calipers, um, calibers, rulers, anything that it takes uh, to, get, to get, um, get the job done. We use lots of straight edges uh, because some of this stuff simply needs to be straight. Uh, this one is dead straight. Um, we, need to, we need to do this. We, we, we want to make sure there's not sort of these, these odd curves um, or odd dips as we do this. So very similar, I guess, to, to the car guys that, that, um, that want to do really good fender work or body work. But we, uh, we want some straight lines, so we'll use straight edges. Anything from a six inch rule all the way up to a, to a one foot rule, I'll use. Uh, and I use, when I get close, I use these a lot because I want that line to be, to be as straight. It, it needs to be, it needs to be, um, both pleasant to look at and when you get your finish on if, if you've got a lot of dips or or inconsistencies in the shape of the into the shape of the gun or the gun stock um, that'll really start to show up in the finish uh, finish is another subject we can talk about it another time uh, there's a lot of ways to do finish um, some of the guys some of the guys will go over the top and put in these really mirror like um, thick epoxy almost looking finishes. I'm not that guy. Um, I prefer, I prefer a, a really nice deep finish, something that looks like you're looking deep into, into, the, into the wood, but, but not a finish that's so bright that it, that it glares back at you. So we'll talk more about finishes um, later on in this project. So that's how we get to this sort of rough state at this point. Um, this, this stock is really, it's, it's almost done, it's almost ready for sanding. Uh, this is the one I was mentioning that I, that I have to do the, uh, the inlay into it. Um, so I've got to get that done before I start doing my final finishes on it. It's still a little bit big. I've still got to roll some, some things in. And I've got some pencil lines where I want to, or intend to roll the tops of this, this stock in. Um, I want to get these, these, um, these reveal lines as narrow as I can and still have the strength in the gun and still have the, the gripping for this. <clears throat> the, uh, the, last, the last episode we talked about classical design and, and how, you, how we sort of got to classical design. There's no hard and fast rules to this stuff. Um, Change is good. Ideas are great. You know, people need to have have ideas. Who pu who puts uh, who puts um, um, flames in the side of their gun stock? I mean, it's just there's no hard and fast rules. The classical designs are more more intended for things like um, where where you where you grip it, what the distance is from from the trigger, uh, from the butt to the to the grip and the trigger, all those come into play. Where's your where's your comb height? Uh, how are you going to use the gun? Do you want that eye line to be in line with a with an open sight? Do you want that eye line to be in line with a with a scope? How big's your scope? How tall's your scope? Um, what kind of bases do you want to use? Do you want to use a scope with, with an undermount that allows you to see the sights as well? There's so much to really consider when you, when you think about stock design. Um, I wouldn't call it overwhelming, but I would also not call it an easy thing to, to get through without, without talking and thinking. Um, those classic designs, um, again, traditional from probably, probably the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. This gun stock, this Springfield um, stock, it, it is not classic or traditional in, in the sense that its shape is different. Um, sort of those, 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 those critical dimensions, they're there. You can't avoid those if you want to, if you want a gun stock that's going to fit and, and, and serve the, uh, the shooter, um, there are some things that you just can't, you can't get away from. We talked a little bit about those in a previous, previous episode, but there's no, again, there's no hard and fast rules on, on how we get, get where we where we end up. And everybody, everybody is different. Everybody's body is different. You got short guys, fat guys, skinny guys, tall guys, 
um, slight guys, muscular guys, and, and all of that affects the, um, affects the design, affects the stock. And, and anybody that wants a, a, a gun built just for them, hey, go and do it. You know, I mean, that's, that's what uh, a, a custom uh, smith exists for, you know. One of the problems with that, and we run into this down at, down at the shop, down at Rody's, the retail shop, guys will modify these guns. And then um, one day their family will come in or, or they'll come in. They're all done shooting. They're all done hunting. And, and we can't, it's, it's difficult to sell those guns because if the stock has been shortened by three quarters of an inch or an inch because this was a slight individual, uh, it's hard to sell to, to the average guy. The same thing with, with a gun stock that you've made longer because, um, because you're, a, you're a big dude. Um, again, it's, it's easier to cut a gun stock down than to add, add uh, stock length back in. It can be done, but it's, it's, it's going to look like it was done in most cases. So, so it's a hard thing, hard thing to accomplish. So for anybody considering a, a custom stock, um, there are, again, those sort of traditional standard lengths that, that uh, they exist. They, they exist because somewhere in the past, somebody figured out what the average person, average person looked like. This is not traditional in its shape. Um, this is, I believe, and I'm not, don't, I don't want to be sort of held to task on this. I believe this is what they call the California style. And if you guys, and this is the California style, if I'm, if I'm correct, comes out of the 60s. Um, in the 60s, it was the time of spaceships, uh, jet planes, and Star Trek. So you began to get these these sort of radical radical shapes based on based on swept back wings and 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 bullet shaped um, noses and that sort of thing, and these this stock has some things um, that are not traditional and they're okay they're not unattractive. Uh, for instance, this this has the um, the um, additional. Uh, wood tip. It's a different material. It's different on the tip than it is on the uh, the body. Uh, I'm looking at this, and I don't know for a fact. Um, I'm thinking mahogany, but it it may be cocobolo. It's a little difficult to see and, and judge this right now. But it has this 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 tapered um, this tapered um, cut. With with a uh, it's either a plastic or another wood inlay that that will help make separated and make it stand out. And then it has the opposite slant on the back. Um, the, the guy that owns this wants me to, to round it over and um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, I'm going to have to play with this a little bit because that, that angled um, cut may, be, uh, may fight that, I don't know yet, artistically. And typically, this California cut, we talked in a very early episode about how this was sort of square in this, this area. And they are typically square in that area. He wants me to round that over as well. But he basically is asking me to make a classic, classic gun stock out of this. And some of that may, may be difficult to do because the dimensions, the wood's not there to create this. Um, so I may have to just do some kind of a blend between that California style and a, and a traditional traditional gun stock. Another thing that this has, it has the, um, the swooping or sweeping grip. Uh, so it doesn't have a, a grip cap like a more traditional gun stock does. Um, I've got this, this cap that, that goes onto the pistol grip. Um, whereas this one just has this, this, this sweep um, where it actually gets much wider um, at, 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 the, at the outside. This, this is designed not to have a cap on it. So um, it doesn't, but it has, again, the same wood that they used up on the um, tip. They used for the cap with the same either plastic or wood um, uh, divider or splitter in there. It's going to be real pretty when it's done, I have no doubt. Um, so I'm going to maintain that sweep, but I'm going to try to try to temper it down a little bit so it's not not quite as dramatic as this one is. Uh, it also has a palm swell. Palm swells. Palm swells quite 
it's it's a bulge in in the side of the uh, it's a bulge in the side of the the, the grip that that fits into the uh, into the the palm of your hand. Palm swells are something that you either love them or you hate them. You're, there is nothing in, in between. I've never found anybody that wants just a little bit of a palm swell. You either love them or you hate them. The guy that owns this hates them. He, does, he wants that palm swell taken away. That's easy to do. Um, not, not, not such a difficult thing to, to take that material away. You know, I just talked a little bit about the sweep of a, of a pistol grip. In fact, even in traditional design, at the at the uh, cap area, it should taper out a little bit. The, the cap area should be slightly wider than than the um, the the lowest the lowest dimension or smallest dimension of of the grip area. Um, this this one this one has that sweep, so it's 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 good to go. So we want to do that as well, and then of course just starting starting to round over these edges, and I'll start using again this this rasp and start sort of shaping it, and get to some get to a shape that I believe is close to to what what the owner is looking for. Um, all of this is heavy and thick um, because when when the the manufacturer that made this the semi the semi finished stock they always leave extra materials so so you have the opportunity to to skinny these things up and make them uh, make them what you want them to be this has the uh, cheek piece and i'm going to uh, i have i have my method for doing this i'm going to uh, uh, cut away an, an arch on the inside so that this thing slants in like this and then I'm going to put about a 16th inch reveal that chases or follows this this shape all the way around I just I like that I think it's 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 a nice nice detail and when I get ready to to get under there and sand this thing um, I'll do that final shape with with the uh, conduit it's it's the perfect it's the perfect sweep for that, so it was perfect for me. Sweep for getting underneath all of that. All right. So then I'll do that, and I'll probably carry that theme all the way around and do a little bit of an undercut here as well. I'm not sure I'm going to do a uh, a reveal here. I might. We'll see how that comes out. This whole this whole this whole dimension is really way oversized and, and thick. Um, so I got I, I got I I need to really think about this a little bit and and again all of this all of this needs to blend nicely into the receiver. So there's an arc, there's an arch to the top of that receiver. And and this arch needs to it needs to just be a continuing line. So it's like you're coming off the arch of the of the metal and right into the arch of the wood and then it sort of follows that same arch uh, or arc and then then uh, fades away into the side of the gun stock. Um, so we need to get we need to do that as well. I think that's it. I think that pretty much sums up how we're going to get get to this. Um, I'm going to end this episode um, about design and, and methodology right here. And uh, when we get back after this, what I'll do is I'll actually be be carving away material at that point and I'll, I'll let you in on that. I'll let you see how, how we do that. It's a lot of fun. So, exciting. Um, I like getting to this point in, in, in the gun stock because it, at this point it really becomes me, uh, the craftsman, uh, sort of determining the art of, of, of the firearm. The inletting, uh, the inletting is just plain tedious craftsmanship it's just it's just me and my chisels it's just me working very slowly to get get where the inlet fits it, it is a dimensional thing it is it is a, a process that is not negotiable these parts need to simply fit in the depths have got to be right the the recoils have got to be right the widths have got to be right so that's sort of non-negotiable we simply need to make the um, the, the inletting a, a um, mirror or positive of the barrel itself. It just has to be that way. So I don't get a lot of choice in that. I just need to do the work. The OD then becomes the art. It's, it's the part that really is, is um, for any artist, I guess, is the most fun. It becomes the most creative part. All right, so um, 
I think we'll end it right here. And the next time we get together, we'll be, we'll be looking at how, how we cut away some of this material. All right. See you next time. Thanks for watching.